Hey guys, it's Trevor coming to you with another video. And today in this video, we are going to check out how you can generate data using PowerShell. So have you ever found yourself in a situation where you just wish you, wish you had some sample data to play with so you could test out how to filter and sort and parse different types of data? Well, I've got a solution for you today. It actually comes thanks to a third-party module. It's open source from uh, Microsoft MVP Doug Fink, who created a module called Name It. So let's switch over to our web browser and go to powershellgallery.com. So at powershellgallery.com, we have all of our different software packages that we can install for PowerShell. Uh, PowerShell Gallery is basically the equivalent to Python's package index or NPM for JavaScript or Maven for things like Java. So it's basically just a package repository and we can search for different types of modules. So let's search for this module called Name It. As you can see, there is a single module available there. And we can come down and look at the file list. So we can see that because it's a PSD1 and PSM1 module file, it is a PowerShell script module. It wasn't written in C Sharp and compiled into a .NET assembly. So we do know it's just a native PowerShell module. So pretty much just plain text there. We can see it's been updated about six months ago. So, you know, back uh, maybe August of 2018, roughly. And it's gone through a few different versions. So as you can see under functions here, we can take a look at the different functions that have been exported from this module. So once we install the module locally, these are the different functions that we can actually run inside of our PowerShell session to generate random data. So you can see that there are different functions like address. So if you wanna generate just a random kind of address looking value, obviously not real data, but uh, just kind of generating something to, to look close to what an address might look like. Uh, we can generate a person, first and last name, uh, a state, uh, generate GUIDs. PowerShell actually has a built-in command called new-guid for that as well. Uh, generate a Fortnite username, apparently. I'm not sure what that's used for, but uh, more power to you. Uh, there's also a commandlet, so we can just generate kind of a random verb-noun uh, kind of commandlet name, right? So a bunch of different useful functionality available in here. So let's take a look at how to actually install this in uh, PowerShell and then actually start calling the different commands. So I'm gonna switch back over to Visual Studio Code here, which is my preferred editor for pretty much anything, uh, anything from documentation to PowerShell to JavaScript to HTML, et cetera. And I'm just gonna do Control N to create a new file here and do Control K M to select my language mode of PowerShell. So that's going to switch on the IntelliSense and the syntax highlighting and all that kind of stuff. And then you'll see that when I activate the PowerShell extension, it also brought up the PowerShell integrated console here on the right hand side. And if you're looking at this and you're like, hey, how did you know how did Trevor get that PowerShell console on the right hand side? Just hit control comma to bring up your user workspace settings. Click on this little open settings.json here, and you will see. I'll hit control tilde to close the console just so we get a better view here. And what you'll see is I have a setting called workbench.panel.defaultLocationWrite. So by default, it will appear on the bottom, but you have the choice of bottom or right, depending on your preference to put the terminal off to the right-hand side. The panel in, in VS Code actually contains a few different panes, but um, you know most people probably realize uh, it for, recognize it for the, the, the PowerShell console. So I uh, just wanted to show you that's how I changed my setting there. Uh, I'm going to close my user settings, close the regular settings pane, and hit control tilde to bring back open my terminal. So on the left-hand side, I've got my PowerShell code. Um, and today, we're just going to learn how to code using this module called Name It. So to install the module, there's a handy PowerShell module called, or sorry, PowerShell command called install module. So install module should be available out of the box for you if you are running PowerShell version five or PowerShell version six. And it's got a parameter called name. 
and you can just specify the name of the module that you want to install. Now, if you try to run this, you might actually get an error that says, hey, administrative rights are required to install modules. And that's because the default installation path for PowerShell modules is under the program files directory. And it does require an administrator to change the files in there. Now, what you can do to work around this, my, my preference as far as best practices go, is to use the scope parameter and then specify the current user scope, which will basically instruct PowerShell to install this module to my personal documents directory. So it's under documents slash Windows PowerShell slash modules, etc. right? And then I'll just tack on the force parameter that it's just going to override any prompts that might occur. If so, if I hit F8 and do install module, it should only take a second to pull down the latest version and install it locally. So once that is finished installing, you know, the next thing you are going to want to do is to explore the PowerShell commands that are available. So earlier we looked at the web browser here and it shows me the functions that are actually available in this module. But what I'm going to do is use PowerShell to uh, kind of discover the commands that are available in the module. So to do that, we use PowerShell's built-in get command command. And then get command has a parameter called module. And we can just specify the module name, name it in this case. And it's going to basically go out to that name it module and query for a list of commands that are available. So as you can see, the list of commands here in our console is pretty much matching what we saw in the web browser. And so let's get started and start generating some data. So let's go ahead and just try a few of these commands like noun. So noun, sweet, support, impact, current, freedom, risk, count. Uh, so some, some interesting nouns there. Uh, let's try verb. So we've got fail, repair, passage, branch, bug, tune, tend, machine. OK, that's enough. Um, so yeah, some interesting verbs there as well. Uh, I'm not really sure when I would want to use those just randomly. I'd pr probably use them more on a on a case by case basis. But uh, it is there if you just want to use a verb as a filler. Now you'll notice that these nouns and verbs were actually emitted with a capital letter. And so one of the nice things about PowerShell is that it's actually built on .NET. And in .NET, a string often has built-in manipulation things. So what we can do is take the output of the verb command, which in this case looks like it's a string. Let's actually verify that by using the get member command. So I'll just do verb get member. And yeah, sure enough, we do have a system.string. And the nice thing about get member is that it actually took that string that we passed into it using the pipeline and it is querying it and it's saying, oh, you're a system.string object. Uh, here are all the .NET methods that are available on a string object that allow you to manipulate it. So what I wanted to point out here is that we can wrap the verb command in parentheses. And then because we know it's going to output a string, we can call the uh, to lower. So there should be a method here called to lower. We have two upper here. Uh, oh, there's two lower. So we can do dot two lower. And if we hit F8, now you can see when we run verb dot two lower, we actually get the entire string as lowercase instead. So if you're putting the verb somewhere in the middle of a sentence, um, this is probably going to turn out badly, but I like to eat, uh, or I like to verb. Uh, food. And then if we fill in with a verb here, we're just using .NET string formatting. I like to quit food. I like to snow food. That's interesting. I like to at attack food. Well, that, that's true. I like I like attacking my food. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just kind of an example of how we can do string interpolation there using .NET string formatting. Um, and obviously in this case, the verb is is not quite correct because it has a capital letter but what we can do is just wrap it in the to lower and then we have to put that in parentheses just because of the dotnet string formatting here 
and I like to parent food. So now we're using a lowercase letter to lead off the word. I like to dry food. Okay, um, let's move on. So we also had some other names, um, sorry, other Power, PowerShell commands. So I'm gonna go hit uh, F8 here on line number three. And we have things like person, uh, space, state, uh, also address. So let's say that you wanted to kind of generate some like random, you know, fake user data. So you, you were building some kind of system and you wanted to, you know, inject it or populate it with a bunch of user data or user like data. So what we can do is use the person command. So I'll do person. So Emily Williams, Amanda Jones, Joshua Williams, Amy Turner, Paul Roberts. Okay, so we got a, some random names here. And it looks like it's just first name, space, last name. So what I can do, another cool thing is uh, strings have a split method. So I can just do split on a space. And now I get the first name followed by the last name. And so I can actually separate the first name and last name as separate properties. And I'll show you why we're gonna do that in a second. Uh, let's, but first let's take a look at the address command. So, you know, there's, there's just kind of a random looking address. It's kind of gibberish looking to an extent, you know, they're not real streets, uh, but you know, it is, it is helpful if you want something that looks kind of like an address. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at how to create a, you know, a person or just generate a person's first name and last name and an address, let's apply the concept of PowerShell classes to give us a little bit more structure around this data. Um, so uh, let's also check out state too. So if I do state, we have uh, Hawaii, South Dakota, Nevada, Vermont, etc. So the, the United States, uh, 50 states, right? So let's go ahead and build a class structure to represent a person. Um, now it's, it might complain. Oh no, it's, it's not gonna complain. So I don't have a conflict with the function person and the class person, because we use different syntaxes to uh, reference a class versus a function. So no, no conflicts there in the naming. So I'm gonna define a PowerShell class, which is just kind of a data structure or a, a blueprint for what a person could look like. And then I'll give the person a first name property and a last name property. We'll also give them an address and a state. And so we can create a new person by calling the stat static new method. Uh, so that's how you construct an instance of a class in PowerShell. So I'm just gonna select all that and hit F8. And you can see that we actually generated a person object with a first name, last name, address, state, but they're all empty, right? They're not initialized to any particular values. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and customize this class to initialize with values. So you might tr say, okay, I'm gonna try to set address equal to uh, the address function. Uh, well, PowerShell doesn't like this particular syntax. So um, let's try to wrap it with parentheses. Uh, and it looks like that will work. So we can actually initialize a property using a function call. We just have to make sure that we wrap it in parentheses. So let's go ahead and select this again. We'll redefine our class and instantiate it. And sure enough, we get an address. But what if we try to do that with first name and last name? Well, if you recall, the person function gives us a first name and a last name. Um, and if we call split, we're only gonna get, you know, a first name or a last name. So uh, what we wanna do is actually create what's called a class constructor. So it's basically a function that gets called when a class is instantiated. And the way that you do that is by just creating a method called the same thing as the class name. So we have a class called person and we're going to define a method called person as well. So in the person constructor, what we'll do is we'll say this dot first name, actually, sorry, before we do that, we'll say my person equals person. So we're basically gonna generate a person and then this my person variable, we want to split. So we'll do my person equals my person dot split on a space. And then we are going to assign this dot first name equals my person 
zero. So we're indexing into this array. So we've split the string into two pieces. We're going to index into that array and grab element zero for the first name. And this dot last name equals my person item number two in the array, which is index number one. And then under state, state's easy as well, because we can just call the state function in the initializer and set the state right there. So now we've got this class fairly well filled out. Let's go ahead and test this out and make sure it works as we expect. And sure enough, it does. Uh, we did learn to code successfully here. We set the first name to Philip, last name Sanders, address, and state. So uh, that seems to be working pretty well for us. So I just wanted to kind of demonstrate to you the name it module and some of the value that it provides. Um, we, we can generate random data, uh, names, addresses, states, verbs, nouns, etc. Uh, so play around with it. You can use that to generate some random data. One thing I will add on here as well is that um, we can export data. So we can take objects like this person class and actually export it to a different format, which is good for data exchange between different systems that interpret data differently. So instead of instantiating just one person, let's uh, use the PowerShell range operator and generate maybe 10 people. So I'll say one to 10. And then I'm going to use this shorthand for each loop and do person new. And if we do that, you'll see we get 10 random people. So that's nice, a little bit of randomness to our data there. And then we can add onto our pipeline here and say export CSV, say no type information. And I think we can just do that. Let's try that. Oh, yeah, we have to put a path on there as well. It doesn't just export to uh, to a string, unfortunately. Um, but I'll do people.csv. And now, if we just do get content raw on people.csv, you can see that we've got this nicely formatted uh, CSV data, right? So uh, you can use this CSV data to you know, ingest into a database, whatever you want to do with it. It's, it's now in a standard CSV format. You can also use the um, export, or export JSON command to uh, convert the data to JSON format. So let's just do that really quick here. Uh, export JSON. No, convert to JSON, sorry. And then we'll hit F8 on that. And we get this huge JSON array containing a bunch of new random users. So that's just kind of an introduction to the Name It module. Uh, thanks to Doug Fink for creating that open source module. Uh, it's a great tool for the PowerShell community, and I encourage you to give it a shot yourself. Um, if you want to incur if you want to uh, support this channel, uh, please feel free to check out my Patreon page. Uh, you can financially support me over there. Definitely helps to motivate creation of new content. Leave a like on the video, uh, subscribe to the channel as well, and leave me a comment to let me know what other kind of content you'd like to see on the channel. Thanks for watching. Cheers.